This podcast is a collaboration between Costard and Touchstone Productions and the Dads from the Crypt podcast. You all say you love me and are beholden to me and then take it easy, cat. We're going to take care of you. And the first time I ask you to do one little thing for me, like rob one little thing. <laughs> Welcome to a bonus episode of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast. I'm Alan Katz. I'm Gil Adler. The reason we're doing a bonus episode is because someone who appeared on our podcast, Elliot Silverstein, just passed away, alas. 96 years old. Uh, a great run. And uh, and a great I, friend of ours. Hmm. A great friend of ours. He did the episode, um, you know, I flew in and went to his his retirement home. That's right. And for the two sessions that we had, I uh, brought him a pastrami sandwich for one time, right? Which I saw him. My wife and I saw him gobble up. And oh, then the next time, it. and the next time I said, "What would you like us to bring?" And he said, "Any chance for bagels, lox, and cream cheese?" And I said, "Absolutely." And you, and you were was, there. You you were there when we recorded him. You actually sat with him. Yeah, I was in right. his room. Yeah. Yeah, because and then, Elliot ninety six and and not not a tech, technologically uh, a comfortable person in any way, shape, or form. I think he's still figuring out the VCR. Uh, he needed someone really to 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 handle all the equipment, and so we sent our 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 ace tech. <laughs> <laughs> tech <guy, laughs> Gill, it, it's it, amazing! It, it's amazing <laughs> if we got anything recorded. Holy <laughs> shit! That was well, that was. Now that I think of it, that was madness. What were we thinking? Are we well, out of our I, mind? I, I I also got a pastrami sandwich out of it, and also bagel slugs and cream cheese, which I we will, shared before the podcast. I will point out that I got none <laughs> none of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, well, we oh, we will miss him. Always the bridesmaid. Well, we, yeah. well, we miss him, and as we tell you in the podcast, Indeed. what what it was like in his career, and what was it like working with him on our show. Yeah, Elliot was, he was a very different kind of director. He really saw the whole show in his head before he walked on the set day one of prep. Mm. And he would demand that we rewrite the script to match the vision in his head so that there was not a wasted moment, so that we weren't shooting stuff that would never end up in the cut. At first, it was challenging to work that way because none of the other directors were that precise and, and having that vision in their head, they get into the editing room and, you know, they cut it together. But Elliot had the whole show in his head already. And really every day was a matter of getting the bits and pieces that he needed to complete his vision. Uh, what a, a very particular way to work compared to really almost everyone else we, we work with. So with love and respect, and every time I have a pastrami sandwich i think of you him ended now. up in tv really early on you, you were in a, a production assistant on omnibus right and it was you eventually got an assi a directing assignment on while you were still at omnibus was that how how directing you. began for you i left a teaching job at brandeis university come up into the city somebody there knew somebody at the staff of uh, the uh, program they gave me a chance to pick up notes and deliver things. Gradually, somebody had a problem with uh, a uh, program which was involved with the ancient Greek tragedians. And they were about the conference table, and they were about to break up the meeting for the day. And somebody said, is that it? And I said, no, it's not it. Oh, who are you? I, you know, I was the guy that brushed off the table. After <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you've got Corinthian t columns there. And I didn't have Corinthian columns in that there. Like, who the hell was this guy? Mm -hmm. So they asked me for more, and I gave them a little history of scene design. And they tore up that version of it and re redid it a little bit. And I was a golden boy after that. Having worked with you, um, you have such a clear sense of how to tell every story I've ever worked on with you. You it's you 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 see the whole you i feel like you you see the finished show inside your head as you go to do it yeah pretty much okay when did that start when i was a baby <laughs> oh dear okay all right i 
got into that because it was the only way that a, a, a man who was uh, relatively short compared to leading men could get a job. And so I got a job, and then they saw there were some other things I could do. There were some waste paper baskets that needed to be emptied. <laughs> and uh, from then on, I got some breaks. From the first time that you, you took up the uh, the mantle of, of director, you had a, a clear visual approach, an, an approach to the storytelling where you saw the whole thing in your head from the get-go. Not quite the whole thing, but much of it. <clears throat> that should have discouraged me right away. <laughs> what I was seeing was not yeah. pleasing me a lot, but it was it was uh, the stepping stone that I had to utilize in order to get to the next step. And then the next one was perhaps prophetic. I was uh, allowed to erect a uh, commercial for the Ford Foundation. The next thing I know, I was asked to direct a Christmas show that is not really directed because they already had a director, a wonderful guy named Seymour Robbie, but he didn't have the literary background to understand what was going on in this this uh, project, the original title, which was The Second Shepherd's Play. It's a very famous sure, spot sure. in yeah. development history. One of the medieval yeah. mystery plays. So I was allowed to go into the control room and uh, each Seymour and I worked out the the choreography, the, the visual choreography, and that was a really great hit. Variety gave it a very good review, and I felt very good about that. And then I set it up from there, little pieces to, to let me do the camera work also. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was in New York, or that was in New York, yes. yeah. Do you, do you feel like that perhaps in a way because of the nature of, of how how TV was then in, in terms of how you had because you were were you shooting them were you shooting things live and, and, and then cutting live? Yes. Okay. So in, in terms of just the, the 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 muscle memory that you develop in in, in, in a in a TV control room, you know, that kind of directing where it's you know it's you know, to that camera, to that camera, to that camera, where it really is, you, you, you will benefit from walking in the door, having a sense of, of where the camera, which camera you should be, you know, thinking through. Well, Seymour was a great help and very patient uh, uh, helping me uh, do that because that was a crazy threshold to cross. I'm sure. The actors and, yeah. and the producer and the the network and then everybody else, and then finally to get down to my problem. And I probably never, I never learned how to handle that. I never learned how to handle the executive uh, interference. Never did. I'm uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, well, that, I'll, that I'll would just say that, I'll just say that by the time he got to Tales from the Crypt, uh, he handled the management pretty well. <laughs> well, it, yeah. management, I would say he handled the management pretty well. What does that reading connote? It means you handled the management, meaning me, pretty well oh, when we did yeah. tales. Say something about that. Yeah. People in charge of many of the network shows at that time were not trained mm. on any level. Now, Gil knew his beans. I mean, he knew what, what I would say, X, Y, and Z. He knew what the hell I was talking about. And maybe even have a comment that was worth listening to. Uh, but in many cases, there, there was somebody climbing the corporate ladder. And it was viewed as a successful event if he could be get a, get a renewal of a contract because he maybe renewed a, a show or pointed out this and that and the other thing. And, oh, and the... the uh, uh, level higher than that took notice of the fact that he made a comment. I ran into trouble with that kind of thing, as many directors do if they made the wrong move, and I made plenty of wrong moves. There was a guy who was a head of public relations for one of the companies, and he was asked to produce a show. Now, public relations and production are about as far as you could want to get. Mm -hmm. One is to tell everybody what's happening, and the other is not to tell them until you have to. He they used to call him Mumbles. But for a public relations guy, they mumbles. I mumbled. You couldn't understand what the hell he was talking about. 
But that is the worst part of it. The worst part of it is the distinctive difference between tell them what they want to know and withhold that to keep them around. The big difference. And he was giving all the information about the who done it to the audience, uh, despite my groans of pain and efforts to to educate him. He had the confidence of the management, and I only had the confidence of 2,500 years of theatrical history, which didn't matter much to him. Yeah. So there was no way for me to hold on to any kind of suspense. Mm. So that was uh, a trick which I had to utilize later on, which was to make something out of nothing. Mm. And it involved having the other actors look at each other with a plum, astonishment. Uh-huh. What, is he, what is he doing to us? And the audience, being trained in a different way, thought that that meant that they didn't know who did it. Mm. Uh, so it, it somehow escaped the notice of a lot of people, but it, it was an embarrassment. He later, of course, was promoted. <laughs> like failing that's upwards. The, that's the button on the story. He, of course, was promoted. Yes. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You were never ever a corporate guy. Generally speaking, you're right. I, my goal would be measured in ways other than serving the corporate needs of a network. Uh, I, I, I imagine myself being the first audience. You have a long history with the Directors Guild of America as uh, mm-hmm. really doing all kinds of things. Uh, creative rights was, I mean, you were one of the first people that I, I think I really talk about it. The whole idea of a director's cut, really, that comes from you, doesn't it? Yeah, yes, it does. I, I never really enjoyed those fights. I looked, I had the good fortune of working with a number of really excellent producers one of them sitting next to me, uh, another one being like Sam Spiegel, who's out here. Oh, who, gosh. Who knew, <laughs> yeah, wow, okay. Uh, oh, him. <laughs> that's, 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 good, that's good company to be in. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, a good producer knows what you are trying to do, not trying to enforce his views of what should be done on you. Uh, that, that becomes uh, useless. And it was all an accident of the way uh, movies, the uh, way uh, film work began, because as you probably know, it began with uh, people doing this kind of little trick thing where uh, the kids used to go a kaleidoscope and things mm. of that nature. And then somebody came along and said, hey, wouldn't it be good if we could sell this? Said, yes, we'll sell it. All right, fine. Well, oh, that was so good. We'll need more than that. Well, I can't do more than that. Well, well, we'll have a guy come in and help you produce it. We'll call him a producer. So he produced it. And then the producer got too much to handle because it got so popular. So we'll have an executive producer. And then eventually it went up the line till it became uh, de rigueur. And the people who superseded or stood on the shoulders, as I say, of the, of the producer, uh, instead of being a help, they tried to get in on the process. And having different goals, one was the show and the other one was the, the ratings, because they're very often different, as you undoubtedly know. Mm. Uh, and it was a, gradually the system grew stronger and easier to understand from a corporate point of view. Mm-hmm. And that's, we're stuck with that now. Uh, before we we uh, abandon the early your early years of TV, you among the the shows that you did, you've got four Twilight Zones to your credit. Four, yeah, something like three or four, yeah. Four, I've I've I can tell you four. Okay. According to the IM, IMDb Pro. Okay. I, and I trust them because I pay them. <laughs> okay. You have four. There are four. Um, you wrote uh, two, I think at least two of your episodes, maybe three, were Rod Serling scripts, and one was a Richard Matheson, the other one was a Richard Matheson script. I didn't write them. No, no, but what I'm saying, Rod Serling wrote three of your scripts, and Richard Matheson, another terrific writer, it's possible. Excuse me, wrote wrote another of your of your Twilight Zone episodes. So you had, you know, really, you had good scripts to work with. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's the beginning of everything. Hmm. 
uh, so that one, that one respect, writers are correct. If they are, if they're the ones that start the process, they start with the germ, and the germ gets more infectious. And, and it's also, a, it's also, it seems to me, an indication uh, with people like uh, Matheson and and Serling that they would trust their material. That's that's probably, my next question. <laughs> yeah, since they probably had the pick of the litter to say, okay, I want this fellow or this gal to direct my work, that they consistently went back and forth and back and forth to Elliot. What was the experience of uh, of of directing? Because not only is is was Rod Serling the writer, he was a producer on the show, so he he's 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 your boss. He never had it. He never stepped forward. Right. So he 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 let you do your work. It was well put together. So the, the the better the script was put together, the easier it was to to mount it. Hmm. But most importantly, he trusted you to do your work. Well, I suppose it's that. Did he trust me? I don't know. If he trusted well, me. hey, you know, when yeah, if, it's, uh, it's if a minimal of trust. interference. I guess maybe it does come down to trust. It always to me. It always comes down to trust. I mean. Yeah. Gosh. You know, I always say to people, if I if I can't trust you, then there's no sense in you trying to work for me. I I I, I can't I can't do anything about that. So if if uh, if you've lost trust, uh, to me you've lost everything. Yeah, and I, mean, I think these guys in the early stages of television, uh, even even more so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to a degree, they were inventing the medium and how the medium was going to look and feel and play, how how it would tell stories. Uh, but when you're talking about the beginning, uh, as to when these rules were established, you got to realize it was a desert. There was no half-hour shows or even fifteen-minute shows. They just crept onto the screen with great hope, uh, and. Uh, eventually established a methodology yeah and that's when uh, the, the the escalation i described a moment ago was, was started uh where you had one producer did one show and then he got he got so good hmm. he had two or three and he had to do them uh, in the course of a day or a week he needed help so he got some others and then they got were so popular they got uh hungry and they had to have assistance, so then it moved up till finally it got to the corporate big wigs, uh, who, are, who are less and less now, occasionally. Now it's corporations that are the, the authors. Mm, mm -hmm, mm. Nobody else is. No, again, just for perspective purposes, I mean, if you think about that, this was all happening in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, playwrights were very popular because they had delivered for stage. And so they were the obvious choice to go to for some of the writers. Um, and it was developing and growing from there. The Playhouse 90s and 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 uh, all those theater pieces that they did on television um, were, were sort of the starting point for for television and, and what happened when it went out to the West Coast. Indeed. At, at what point did, did you move from New York to Los Angeles, Elliot? At what point? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, there was a point where uh, shows were moving from New York to Los Angeles. Right. I mean, I wasn't dragged along with them, but uh, eventually there was, I guess, some reason I don't forget what they were. I guess there was less opportunities in New York mm. then. And uh, yeah. so I went out to California, the same people, except it was located in California and the big mockers, the big shots, did not want to move yeah. to Los Angeles, so they stayed yeah. in New York, right? And and gave their godlike instructions <laughs> over the telephone. Yeah, indeed they did. Yeah, you were you you were you were born in Boston. Uh, you were a, a, a complete East Coast person. Yes. Did did you have a particular feeling about Los Angeles before moving out here? No, I mean, it's like buying a house to me. It's not all that important. It's the people in it that interest okay. I, don't, I don't really care very much. So was, be, being in Los Angeles was neither here nor there to you compared to being in New I York? I had no choice. I went where the money was. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, did you enjoy living in Los Angeles versus living in New York? 
nobody enjoys living in Los <laughs> Angeles. I think this is where we play the Neil Diamond song. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Was LA good to you? What, what, once you made the move, was LA good to you career wise? I, I, I know, or I get to know has been good to me. And then they weren't so good to me. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, man, that's LA for you. <laughs> you know, it, it sets you up and then it, boy, does it kick you in the nuts. Boy, <laughs> boy, does it. Fear is king. See, that's the problem. Fear is king. The producers are so afraid of of uh, moving out of the traditional norm into something that's flashier. They are right if it works. And the doing of it didn't matter as much as the, the rating did. And I, I suppose there's some some uh, logic to that. But that, a lot of people, it doesn't affect. They just go ahead and do what seems to be the right thing to do in telling the story. A friend of mine, uh, Frank Pearson, was the story editor for Have Gun Will Travel. They, they had a difficult time knowing what to do with it with the story. This was a story of a Western and the script that I was asked to try to direct was a uh, story editor was Frank Pearson. Yep. And the story began with a little kid trying to take a bath, being given a bath, and he escapes from the bathtub. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. I, I got you. Uh, the, the opening shots. And nobody could really make it work happily because they refused to deal with the one fact that kids at a certain age no longer bathe naked. The mothers usually wrap a towel around them or something. And Frank was a fan of mine, uh, other, other things that I had done there. So I was asked to, to do that. And I, yeah, I said, it's very easy. Get back when the kid leaves the, the, the tub jump way back as far as you can get back so nobody can tell whether he has a whether he's bare ass or not <laughs> and uh, then I, I i love to give arguments to the network people when they haven't got a leg to stand on how could they say he was naked how do you know it's not so far back so that worked and the producers liked that very much and then somebody <clears throat> saw the logic behind my trying to blindfold the uh, network people so I was doing other assignments. You also did Route 66, a couple yeah. of episodes of that. I did. Uh, I, I did one that I wrote too. Yeah, I came out of my apartment in New York on 65th Street and a guy was trying to break open the lock on my car. I said, aha, a show <laughs> across the street. And I drew that, that is how it begins. So we ran up 58th Street, one after the other. You'll see a whole show right here. And as we were running and running and running, I was chasing them. Then I looked behind me, and there were two guys there, heavyweights, the cops. They were chasing me. I was chasing the, the thief over on 58th Street, on uh, 59th Street, subway, down. Wow. We all chased each other down there. Finally, along the, the subway, uh, we got to the end of the tracks. We, and that was it. And the guy held up his arms and he, he was arrested. And the cops were good guys. Uh, they said, what are you doing? Well, we, 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 he couldn't speak. I said, just tell the guys why you did that. And he said, I got kids and they're hungry. I'll never forget that. So I looked at the cops and I said, what are we going to do? He said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't want to do anything but give them a loaf of bread. And they said, all right. So they were a little more talking, and it turned out there was a a uh, national ho hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, I think, for dope addicts. Turned out this guy was a dope addict, and he was buying fam research. Turned out he was buying food or stealing food mm. for his family. So we established that, and the two cops and I did things that neither one of us was supposed to do. We agreed that this guy should not go to jail, uh, but then he would go to the uh, the hospital uh, and uh, see if they can break the habit, and that's what he did. And the cops, God bless them, they stood with him. This is another story. They stood with him in a hotel 
all night long, make sure he didn't get drunk again. And wow. they escorted him to the train and put him on the train and made sure he he got off at uh, uh, the whole uh, the hotel, uh, hotel the uh, the hospital, uh, the, the address for the the, the uh, <laughs> hospital. So the three of us, these two cops and I, saved that guy's life and maybe his family too. And uh, the cops, one of them said something I can't recall uh, exactly what it was, but he said something to the effect that he really served the city well that day. Indeed, uh, they made it. They made a citizen. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, and that was, that was made a difference. Made a difference. Made a big difference. Instead of just locking him up and throwing away the kid. The leap to feature films. Yeah, feature films. Yeah. Uh, how you saw that as an advancement? Yeah, I question the use of the word advancement. The principles are genuinely, generally the same, as you undoubtedly know. They're interrupted at intervals by using them as uh, sales ploys. Mm -hmm. But the basic stuff is the same. Uh, maybe larger, but fancier, louder, softer, this way, that way. But essentially, the rules are somewhat the same, I think. And uh, why? Why did you decide to to do that piece of material, Cat Baloo? What What was it about that well, piece of material? I, 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 it was decided for me. I got. Uh, a call, let me see, what was it? Of the same guy, God bless him, Frank Pearson, who was, who recalled the experience I, that he had at the previous show I mentioned. When, when Have Gun Will Travel. Yeah, <clears throat> and they were having trouble with uh, the script, and the concept of it, where was it going to go? Because uh, the, the one group of the staff wanted to make a whodunit. Another one wanted to make an adventure story. They couldn't quite categorize it. So Frank asked, I guess in desperation, would I come in and talk to them? I said, yes, sure. I don't know, would I ever? Sure, feature film, absolutely. So I went in and there was uh, the producer who was not Gil's kind of producer. This guy was a nervous wreck and a, and a promoter, he wasn't a he, he wasn't a, a filmmaker. Yeah, he attached himself to, to films and was a promoter. And, and they gave me the, the final test. What would you know? That's the story of a, a girl whose life was was ruined by people who hated her father, and shot and cut and killed her father, and she became. A, Two gun mistress of the West. And uh, Jane Fonda was in it, it was already cast. And uh, I was asked a number of questions like, what would you do if they tied her to the railroad tracks? And I said, I don't think that'd be very funny, uh, you know, because it, it just isn't real. You, you knew that wasn't going to happen. They weren't going to put Jane Fonda on the railroad track with a locomotive bearing down on it. She had to get out of it. And if you have to get out of the trap before it even sprung, it doesn't really work too well. So they asked questions like that and a couple of other things. And uh, then uh, they dismissed me. And apparently I, I said some things that they liked to hear. And they called me back in. And then that started down the track to misery. Uh, <laughs> the misery. Harold, Harold Heck, Lord God, him, bless him for giving me that shot. Was a nervous wreck. Oh, it's, it's Harold Heck who, who who you're talking about as as the nervous wreck well, producer. Okay. Trembled. He, was, he really he was couldn't believe it. I mean, I had to show fingernails to make sure that my hands were made up properly, things like that, and I had to bite my lip. Because this was, uh, uh, what I call it, uh, it's, it's, it's so insane. Hmm. Uh, uh, here I was, the director of a 
major motion picture for a major company, and I have to answer questions about would it show a man's hand quivering? And, but at any rate, we got through with that, and then he chased me on every single, almost every single trip down the line. And I had some crazy ones that I was doing. Oh, oh, where, where is she? Where is she? Which way is she looking? Which way? I said, she's looking where she's supposed to look, Harold. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. that's simple. Stuff like that. Lee Marvin gave you an amazing performance as twin brothers Kid Shaleen and the villain Tim Strawn. Well, that was, that was an interesting experience because Lee was, he was still playing the, the heavyweight or the hero gun. <clears throat> and then the company had tried everybody, the superstars all the way down the line. Oh, I should say up the line, but that, that, that's what they were involved with. And there was a conference in the, in the main office. The piece was ready to be canceled because he couldn't satisfy Columbia with a star. And uh, there was a big silence, a deadly silence before everybody throws in the hat. And I said, what about Lee Marvin? Huh? I said, you see him, you see him on the... Uh, he did this. He came off the horse like he didn't know how to ride. Uh, oh yeah, and Frankovich, Mike Frankovich, God bless him, was the head of production at Columbia. He said, "Well, let's try him. Let's try him." We got him. He got the script, and Harold was quivering. He didn't know whether that was a good sign or that was the end of it. So quivering. It, it was a good sign because we uh, went around town reading from the script, funny stuff. And yeah, there was some funny stuff in the script. I, I remember seeing that, that film as a kid and just loving it. It's a fun movie uh, from, from start to finish. It's great fun. It was not fun for me, I gotta tell you. <laughs> well, hey, hey, you know. It rarely oh, is. <laughs> I, I knew what was funny, but I constantly had to look over my shoulder because Harold was there without a sense of humor, judging oh. whether it was funny or not. As long as it got through on time, that was his me. So he could get on to the next project before I killed it. Aside from Harold Hecht, what else called you, <clears> caused <throat> you agita? I don't mean to cast any aspersions. Oh, no, no, no. Hey, look, you know, but it's truth is truth. And, you know, some people are good producers and some people are not good oh, producers. And, and they make working together hor horrible. His name was on some very great films. So oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, but that 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 doesn't mean he was easy to work with. It, it's just no. we're just telling telling. Hey, you know, we're not saying he's a horrible human being. We're saying he was not the easiest person to work with. That's okay too. Yeah, and and, and he might have had better times when he was easy to work with, and times when he was harder to work with. That might be part of his story too. Well, he had everything to be afraid of. Here was a director. First feature film, the budget was low, hmm. the, the issue was huge, whether Harold Heck would ever live to make another movie. Frank Pearson, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, he he was, came up to the office with me, his shoulders were slumped, and he was very worried that the first viewing of a, a cut was not successful, or not didn't seem to be successful. Till somebody in that group started to laugh, and then every all the executives started to laugh. That's the way it works. You got to get an executive in the audience whenever you do a movie. <laughs> and anyway, uh, he uh, he couldn't believe it that it was working out so well. And neither could I, frankly. I mean, I... Our experience making a project <clears throat> doesn't reflect the audience's experience of the project. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's just how it is. And rarely do they even know what oh. is going on day to day Amen. in terms of how you how it's accomplished. Amen. No idea. It, it, it was what we're going to get. Mm. And the first job that I had as a director was to let them know it's okay to laugh at this one. It's okay. Yeah. This is not a real western. It's supposed to be funny. You can laugh. Fine if you don't find a laugh, I'll kill you. But, you know. <laughs> So they left. Yeah. Were you expecting the the critical response, including the Academy? No, Awards that no. no. As a matter of fact, I had a 
that meeting I talked talk to you about, about Frank Pearson, uh, we were both very nervous now, of course, because we didn't know how it was going to be received by the executives. And um, I, I remember saying to Frank, look, this, we finished the first movie that we did. That's the hardest part, is getting that first assignment. We brought it in fairly well on time, blah, 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 blah. blah. Okay, and then the door opened, in came the rewards. Hey, yeah, yeah. So we came close to the guillotine. That's sort of like Mel Brooks's story about uh, Blazing Saddles. Very similar. He didn't know what he had. He went to a screening and thought it was awful, and uh, people started laughing, and uh, you know, the rest is really history. But oftentimes, especially with comedy, you don't know. It's so subjective and it's so individual. Oh, boy. That you don't know if it's going to appeal to uh, as many people as it needs to appeal to. The the success of Cat Ballou, uh, it was commercially and 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 uh, critically, and and you get the awards. Uh, how how did the town approach you afterward? They all wanted me to make another comedy western, mm. which I didn't want to do. Shockingly, I was mean, a kid from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> it was enough. One was enough. The next feature you did was was called The Happening. That's right. And that is definitely not a Western. No, it was definitely not a Western. It had some good things in it, but it just didn't glue together. I didn't glue it right. Why, why do you think it did not get glued right? Because I saw it incorrectly as the opportunity for, for a number of set comic pieces. Instead of looking for some kind of through line, dramatic line. Yeah. Uh, and the result was that if you took in one of those pieces to out and looked at it separately, it might work. But put them all together, you say, all right, all right, what about now? How about now? Let's have another one. No, that one, so we just saw that one, <laughs> you know. So uh, it, it had a couple of, there were a couple of good things in it. Uh, but it wasn't, it weren't enough. Is the man called horse a western? You say, was it a western? Yeah. Mm. Only in the sense that it had horses and Indians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, that piece. That's now. That's a, that's an interesting example. Uh, I <clears throat> was asked to come in and. Uh, Look at this script, like 210 pages long, really wow. a new, wow. long piece. Uh, it had numerous historical pieces in it that attracted me because somebody wanted to do it right. That made me play a closer attention. And uh, I got that assignment. There was some politics in the background that got me that assignment. It was an opportunity to be truthful. Just an opportunity. I couldn't go all the way because some of, the, some of it was a horror story. Mm. It, uh, it was, so far as I could make it, truthful, musically truthful. Uh, the orchestrations were, were, were as close as we could get. The wardrobe was as close as we could get. No event took place. The Sioux Indians uh, from Lakota, Lakota were on the show, almost all of them. I, I didn't let anybody who was not an Indian be a member of the tribe. So they made a lot of phonies were sent back. So when they started to react, some of them could speak English, some of them couldn't. Those that could got excited because they remember their fathers had heard of this tune of that thing. Uh, and they forgot what it was the first time that they remembered. Mm -hmm. So we tried to be as historically ac accurate as it could be while not making a historical document. I was really overwhelmed uh, as I got closer to it to see what these people thought about reality. What, what, they were not the, the, savage, <clears throat> the savages, they were just people defending their homes, but they didn't have enough to do it with. Uh, the, the white men had more and bigger and louder. And so they made me a member of the tribe, among other things. Shukalusa, <laughs> huh? How about that? Shukalusa, huh? Yeah. Uh, that's my Indian name. Say, say it one more time. That it's beautiful. Te shunka lusa. It's fantastic. 
I, I, I'm so envious you have one. Dog, the dog, I shrunk up with something or other. I've forgotten what it was. A holy dog is that kind of thing. I never knew this. I, I, I wish you would have told us this when we were doing tales. I could have come to the set and said uh, whatever you've been just... on your chair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You would have said that on the back of your chair. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, was, that was a tough one. That was perhaps for. For a strange reason, one of the toughest assignments I've ever had in my life. It damn near sent me to the hospital in the middle of shooting. As a matter of fact, I did collapse at one point. I remember exactly the point it was. And the assistant called the producer over. And this tells you what kind of a producer this was. There are producers <laughs> who are concerned about everything, make sure that everything is right and clear and peaceful. So this guy just wanted to please... Gordon Stolberg, who was the newly installed head of uh, the company that made the movie, he cared more about the fact that he had a star agreed to do a movie early in a movie early in his calendar, and that meant that that star could walk over everything. And it wouldn't stop him, and I would not allow that. I mean, I offered to quit, and it scared the hell out of him. And I realized I had the upper hand. <laughs> because he couldn't afford to have that kind of fracture mm -hmm. a, a, a couple of weeks into shooting. So I played that horn as long as I could. And uh, the result of it was when it was all over and, and uh, the, the audits were coming in, he crossed me I was standing on the set doing some other work. And all he wanted was, where's Richard? Didn't even say hello. <laughs> So he wanted to see Richard Harris, who was his feet. So, sounds like Joel Silver. Huh? He what? It, 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 this is a producer out of the Joel Silver handbook. He's just, he just comes to see his star, man. Where's my star? Get out of my way. You're the, the director. I'm not here to see you. Yeah, was pretty much what it was. Wow. But I, I loved the, making that movie because it was the first time in probably three or 400 years that the ceremony that we did there was thoroughly researched and down to what was shown was historically accurate. It would stand up to study. Anyway, I got reports for it afterwards that some uh, scholars used it to back up to show to their classes. Mm -hmm. That was more important to me almost than anything else. The, the key sequence of the movie, the, the uh, piercing of the chest with arrows and ha hanging the uh, recipient up on a high wire or give me a chance to get even with Richard Harris or something. <laughs> <laughs> we left him up there for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that'll teach him. Only, yeah. for, only for lunch? Oh, shit. Uh, it could have been longer, but I think <laughs> I would have lost the picture. They would have sent somebody else to cut him down. <laughs> <laughs> Worked out okay. But that did my heart good to see the old Indians that we had there singing the song. Some of them were 85, 90 years old. And one of them said that was the first time he'd heard, he'd heard his colleague singing that song since his grandfather died. Wow. That made me feel very good. And they made me a member of the tribe. And, you know, that, uh, it was the first time that music in, its, in total had, to my knowledge, and to the knowledge of a historian, uh, Clyde Dollar, who was a white man who was working as a historian in the Indian tribe in South Dakota. Hmm. And anything he knew about it, he just knew everything about it. But he was thrilled to hear that. He thought, oh, so many people are going to hear that music. That meant more to me that there was a piece of real instead of reading dull stuff out of a history book. You remember a sequence in the movie, a sequence where Richard Harris had the bones thrust to his Yeah, 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 yeah. That was just an understatement. What actually happened was, after the man was hoisted up with his bones through his chest and left there until he was unconscious and they cut him down, they let him lie there. Then do you think that was enough for the, the Sioux? No. They dragged him behind a horse until he passed out again. 
think that was enough? No, it was not. They had to do other things to him until he could just barely walk. And who was behind all this? The women. They, unless a man could go through all that and <laughs> live to tell the story, they weren't interested. And so we couldn't show all that because people would have fainted as it was. Some people took that sequence very, very tough to where we was hoisted up. Mm -hmm. There were women that were screeching and a couple of people passed out. But it was understated. This prepared you so perfectly to do Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> <laughs> the only argument the Indian experts had and all the museums that met and sent representatives was the fact that Richard Harris wore a band, like a headband, which was unknown to the Indians at that time. But his, his hair would drop down over his eyes. He didn't have that. He, he demonstrated that's what he would look like unless I let him have that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, all right. The only thing I was asked to compromise and, and, and I didn't. So as far as, I, as far as I know, and it's still run uh, in front of historical scenes, history classes, just for that scene. When did your relationship with Dick Donner start? It's blurred in the history of time, but I believe it was about five, six, seven years before his career began getting hot with the I took advantage of him. Yeah, he took played an extra in one of mine where he went up to a, 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 a an ele elevator and waiting for the elevator. He was supposed to be chatting with the girl. Meantime, his action taking place in the boardroom. And he just stood there like a lump of clay. And, <laughs> and I, 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 I cut what question. Because we're talking with the girl. Come on, you're the prize director. You know better than that. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. But then you couldn't stop him. He was a great guy. <laughs> he really was a wonderful guy. He was just, uh, while we were disconnected, Ellie was just doing a little impression of, of Dick's laughter. Because we, <laughs> we all remember that Dick, ah, 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 ah. Dick has entered the room. <laughs> <laughs> he did have a huge laugh. Yeah, he really did. You actually spoke to Dick uh, shortly before he passed? Yes, because he had called me. I, I, I don't know why, out of the blue, suddenly he called me a couple of times. We had lunch together and talked about many of the things that we've talked about here. And then we thought it might be fun to do a, a piece together on some basis. And I had something I wanted to try with him, and he seemed right. And we were going to talk further about it. And the week that we were going to talk about it was poor guy died. All right, the episodes are Reluctant Vampire, a great episode. Which one? Reluctant, Reluctant Vampire. Reluctant Vampire. Oh, yeah. It was Malcolm McDowell about a, a vampire who, who, who doesn't want to be a vampire, so he works in a blood bank. Yeah. A, a great idea. Uh, well cooked hams. With, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, no, that was no, that was Curiosity Killed. Well cooked hams was Martin Sheen and uh, and Billy Zane. And then uh, uh, Curiosity Killed was uh, uh, that was uh, Kevin McCarthy, Margot Kidder. Right. And I then well, uh, the last one was Surprise Party. Surprise Party. Surprise party. Who was in that one? I think Jake, Jake Busey. Ah. So long ago. <laughs> yeah. A little while ago, yeah. yeah. Another feature film that you did called The Car. Yes. D do you see doing horror as differently than you see doing anything else? Does, 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 horror, it, does telling it, a horror story require other skills? Uh, I was broke. And an executive for whom I had done a favor, called me and asked me if I would do this. Well, it was a mess when I first looked at it. Mm. So I tried to set it right. I made it right in terms of being able to shoot it. A lot of people like that movie a lot. Mm. I understand that. I can't really figure it. I, I like scenes in it. Mm -hmm. 
because it, while it was a compilation of scenes, one horror scene after another. Yeah. That's what in my general, which was wrong. Uh, the major question there was, are you going to reveal the figure of the devil behind the car? And uh, if you remember the movie, you never saw that. And I didn't want to see it because I didn't want to reveal what the sure. devil looked like. Yeah. I may have been wrong. I don't know. I look back now and I think maybe I was wrong because I could have made a hell of a lot more of it. Well, at least now in retrospect, you can go back and think of which studio executive would have been the best depiction of that horror. <laughs> was it this one? Was it this one? Was it this one? Maybe all three or four. Well, actually, I don't think they're actually as mean as they are cowardly. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, I would agree with you. They, they just don't know. And so the attempt to, to present an, an authoritative figure they come off as as uh, mean. Mm -hmm. They don't know which way to turn. It's Alice in Wonderland. You know, it, when we worked with Elliot on Tales from the Crypt, um, and we didn't have the advantage of working on all those movies that he made before that, you realize you had somebody who was a storyteller, and his goal and interest was really good storytelling. <laughs> and anything that got in the way of that was something that, was dis distasteful to him and he would he would he would react to it that way well, which you. was which was the way you wanted somebody to work because the way we collaborate with each other and we sometimes we're in each other's faces and sometimes we're arguing um it's all if it's in the if it's an in, if it's in the interest of good storytelling nobody really minds the no. confrontation i want to since you answered that thesis i want to discuss it with you mm. i'm going to embarrass you there are a few producers around who do really the correct thing. They can argue you right up against the wall to make you to force you to be sure that you've covered all the bases. This is one sitting next to me now. Secondly, he, his ideas were born of the material, not of their fear of something else, which is what I had, the guy I told you about that uh, was talking about... Uh, what would happen if uh, if I did with something? Well, thanks thanks for saying that, but it's true. I mean, when you have an opportunity to work with somebody like Elliot, as we did on numerous occasions, not just one, hmm. you know, you, I very selfishly want to learn from that, and I did. And during the course of that learning, we made good shows together, and ultimately came out with a with a friendship. Indeed, which has lasted all these years. That's right. I don't think most directors, working directors today, know or fully understand and are grateful to what Elliot did as an executive on their behalf at the DGA. Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, in terms of rights and in terms of cuts and in terms of just the work ethic of being a director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That sort of goes by the wayside. People don't really hear or see that that much. And I think your reference to that interview, plus my comment about, you know, what I know about he, what he's done for the DGA is quite exceptional. Hmm. And it's really quite exceptional considering he wasn't an executive. He wasn't an, uh, an administrator. He was a working full-time director in his own right. And yet he found time to figure out and help those that didn't have the capability that he had and didn't have the opportunity that he had. Gosh, yes. And, and, DGA, and, and the DGA creative has, rights, creative and, rights. And the DGA has been forever better for that. You know, it's funny, we're 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 looking at a, at a potential strike across a bunch of the, the guilds coming up in the next couple of uh, months. But, you know, the, the DGA was always way stronger, has always been far stronger than than the Writers Guild. Yes. Um, uh, the answer is that. If push comes to shove, the poor writers get stumped on a lot. Yes, we do. Psycho neurotic. But going back to the Directors Guild, I mean, the architect who had a lot to do with the changes to benefit the life of the director, both economically and creatively, is sitting to my right. Indeed. Uh, thank you. 
if not for for your efforts, if not for your your willingness, just just hey, look, because you cared, because it mattered to you, and you ha- you always had tremendous integrity. Well, nice to hear that. My God, it's a fact of life. I mean, my God, you are nothing but integrity. That's nice to hear that. That's really True, nice truer words were never spoke. On my gravestone, I'm saying, but <laughs> a big eye, a big eye for integrity. But hey, man, it's in in this in this fucking world, integrity is is very hard to come by. And so when when you bump into in, integrity and a person with integrity, you 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 wow, you're like a beacon, man. You know that wonderful story about the, from uh, what's his name, the director. Houston, John Houston. Oh, uh-huh. sure, sure, sure. He delivered a cut to his producer for the uh, one of the movies that he did here. And the producer had something to say. I ran up to him. Tell him what he said. It didn't matter what it was. He said something. Oh, really? Houston started all of you know that story? No. <laughs> he redid it again. Did it again exactly the same way. And the... I said, no, that wasn't right. No, I just, blah, 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 blah. Oh, really? Well, we'll do it again. And uh, they did it again. The, the official count is something like eight or nine times. Not one change was made. He didn't say one single thing. And eventually, the poor producer gave up in despair. <laughs> well, it wasn't amazing. That's our friend, Elliot Silverstein. Uh, See you next time, everyone. The How Not to Make a Movie podcast is executive produced by me, Alan Katz, by Gil Adler, and by Jason Stein. Our artwork was done by the amazing Jody Webster, and Jason Jody, along with Mando, are all the hosts of the fun and informative Dads from the Crypt podcast. Follow them for what my old pal, the Crypt Keeper, would have called terrible rapid Crypt content.